Kia ora, no mai hari mai. Welcome to the Streets Online Service. My name is Jamie Rodwell and it is a pleasure to be here taking you through today's service. Thanks so much for joining us today. So good to see you. I feel a little bit lonely here on this big couch, but we're together, we're talking, we're communicating. It's good to be together, eh? We've got a great service today. Uh, we're going to hear from our, one of our senior pastors, Simon Gill. He is talking about wholehearted praise, and I cannot wait um, to, to, um, get to get to that today. Um, and then Josiah and Kay are leading, leading us in worship. We are going to have such a beautiful time together. I'm so, so, so glad you're here. Uh, a couple of things up top to talk about. Uh, one is, if you are a single person and you call yourself a Christian, maybe if you're not even a Christian, uh, we have a, uh, an event coming up, um, which is an uh, inter-church uh, event, meeting at Waitangi Park, March the 10th at 12.30 for a picnic. And so if you are single and you like food, come on down. Uh, it is kind of weather dependent, but you, there's no like forum to cancel it. So if it's bad weather, don't come. If it's great weather, be there. Even if it's a little bit windy, turn up. That's March the 10th at 12.30. Um, bring a picnic blanket, bring some food and a wonderful warm smile. That would be lovely. Uh, also, last year, you might, have, you might remember us talking about uh, offering free counseling through uh, a guy called Lawrence Benson. Uh, that was last year, but also this year he can offer us some slots. And so if you are interested in some free counseling, I, I love Lawrence. He's such a lovely, warm, kind-hearted guy, He's such a good listener, um, such a good guy. I got to get, get to know him a bit last year. Um, if, if you're interested in finding out more about that, please email us at online at thestreet.org.nz and you can find out um, how to get some free counseling through Lawrence. Wonderful. Hey, we're going to head into a time of praise and worship. So what, what, a, what, a, better, what better way to start uh, our, our series theme today on wholehearted praise than doing just that. So we're going to come together using music and song and lyrics to glorify our Lord Jesus. So can I, can I pray as we head into a time of worship? Father, I, I thank you so much for um, this opportunity to come together and to lift you up. I pray for this time as we, as we sing these songs. Um, would you be glorified and exalted? Lord, would you be blessed as we, as we worship and praise your name? Lord, I pray for every person who's watching now that um, through your Holy Spirit you would uh, connect them um, to the Father, that they would know your presence, they would know the joy that it is to worship you, Lord. And so, Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, let's worship together.
let it be loud let it be loud let it be heard jesus is lord of all the earth all of the praise unto your name When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus.
Welcome to the next part of our Wholehearted series where we are looking at the things God calls us to do with all of our heart. And today we examine wholehearted praise. I wonder if this is a statement that you would say is true of you. Is, is your praise wholehearted? Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if our heart is full of anxiety, that's what's going to come out. If our hearts are full of anger, that's what's going to come out. And if our heart is full of praise, our mouths will overflow with praise. This is our big idea today, a heart filled with praise overflows with praise. And when we notice this, we can actually take ownership of it. Think of a bath, right? If the taps of a bath are turned on fully, the bath will inevitably overflow because the bath is being filled with water. It will overflow with water unless, of course, the plug is out, in which case that there's, there's water going in, but there's also water draining out at the same time. And so we can take ownership of what's coming out of our hearts by saying, what are we putting in? Uh, but also, if we're putting praise in, is it draining out? What are, the, what are the plug holes? What are the drains for us that, that steal praise from us? And so as we go to Psalm 103 today, it's a Psalm of David, a, a poem of David, a song of David. It's a great praise filler. It's a great sort of turn the taps on and fill your heart with reasons to praise, but it also gives us some level of indication. What are the drains? What are the plug holes that might rob us, that might steal us of praise, that would stop it overflowing? And so let's read Psalm 103 together. You might want to read it out loud uh, with me as we go through it. It says this, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. And it closes as it starts. Praise the Lord, my soul. This psalm, as all the psalms are, are poetry. The way it's laid out on the page lets you know that. And Hebrew poetry doesn't function on rhyming lines. It, it, it functions around parallels. And so when we look at two lines together, it, it, it can help us understand what is being said because the same thing is being said in different ways. And so we begin with this, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being praises holy names. These are parallels. Praise and praise appear in, in corresponding lines. Lord here is the word Yahweh, which is the holy name. Uh, it's God's holy name. So holy that Israel wouldn't say it. And, and, and then you come to my soul and all my inmost being. What is our soul? It is all my inmost being. And so what, what David is saying here is, I want every fiber of my being. I want my whole heart to praise the holy name 
of God. And as he carries on, this is sort of tap number one of David turning it on and filling up his soul. He's he's commanding his soul, praise the Lord, but it's not an empty call to praise. He then repeats the first line, praise the Lord, my soul. And what is the reason? Forget not all his benefits. So tap one is remembering God's blessings in our lives. What are they? Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. These two go together. When we acknowledge that we have sinned before God, we can remind our souls, but we are forgiven. We don't have to bury it. We don't have to ignore it. We don't have to redefine sin and pretend it didn't happen. No, we can bring it out into the open. But as we do that, we don't need to live with the guilt of it. No, we can say, oh, you you forgive my sin. You heal my diseases. Our greatest disease is sin itself. It's the thing that leads to death. It's the ultimate cause of death. But as we draw these things out into the open, we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, you forgive me. You wash me. You take away that guilt. You wipe away every trace of it. David says, this is a reason to praise God with my whole heart. Then he says, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Redemption is this idea that takes us to the slave market. Okay, slaves are bound by the will of another, the desires of another. They have to do as they're told. And redemption is the price that pays for the freedom of a slave. It reminds us we were stuck in sin and unable to change, but God has paid for our redemption. God has paid to set us free. We're no no longer slaves to old habits, old mistakes, old patterns of hurting ourselves and others. We are free of it. But actually, scholars think that David is also talking about redemption in an ultimate sense. What is the pit that all of us fall into ultimately? It is death, but he has redeemed us. He has purchased us out of that and, and taken away our chains and given us a crown. He, is, he has taken us from the pit of death and given us the ability to live life with the sure hope of eternal life, with what we're crowned with is love and compassion, the very means by which he has paid for our redemption. And then David says, he satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagle. We are desiring beings. We cannot help but worship. You can't get away from that. And I think in church often we can, we can struggle to talk about desires because it reminds us of temptation. But I want to remind you that Jesus had desires. Jesus had desires. The issue is not the desire. The issue is the object of that desire. Where are we looking to satisfy our desires? You know, you walk around and advertising is everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's on a a bus stop, a billboard, on TV, the banner down the side of your internet browser. All of these things are, are appealing to the desire, saying, satisfy your desires in this way. You just need to buy this. You just need to do this. As I walk around, you know, the Mount Vic area and and the CBD praying um, for the location I lead at the moment, um, I notice places where people are going to satisfy their desires. Shops, cafes, restaurants, bars, betting shops, strip clubs. All of these places are places, some not inherently wrong, but, but all of these places are places where we are going because we have desires that we want to satisfy. And David says, these things will never fully satisfy you. You can try, but you will be hungry again. You will be thirsty again. You will have those desires again. But to come to God is the one who fully satisfies those desires. How does he do it? With good things with good things. A better translation is probably simply just good. And the reason for that is it's the Hebrew word tov. Okay, it is the word that describes the goodness of God. And it is the word that describes the good activities of God. When God says, let there be light and there was light, what does it say? And God saw that it was tov. God saw that it was good. And so this is the the character of God, but it is also the works of God. It is good in the widest possible sense. And so this goodness is the gift of God himself. And it is where every single desire we have ultimately finds its its true satisfaction. Where you never need experience that desire again. This is what I think 
uh, Jesus means when he teaches on prayer. He says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we, when we ask for good things from God, he doesn't just necessarily give you the good things that you think you need. He pours the greatest good into your life, the gift of his good self. And I wonder if sometimes when we have these cravings, when we have these desires and we look in the wrong places for satisfaction for those things, maybe we have forgotten that the greatest good that we have is that through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the, the person of God and the power of God and the presence of God has come to reside in your life, never to leave you again. But then there's the drain that comes, the drain that comes. Notice that David says, forget not all his benefits. All of these blessings that we have just been through, we've talked about the forgiveness of sin, redemption, the satisfaction of desires with good things. There is the, we can pull the plug out when we forget those things. It becomes a drain that such that praise doesn't overflow. We, we can do that through negligence. We can simply be so busy and in such a rush from one moment to the next, then we never actually pause to remember what are the good things that God has done? What are the many blessings that he has given me? We can forget through arrogance. Arrogance says what I've, what I've uh, accumulated, what I have, uh, the good things in my life, I've earned it, I've deserved it, I've built it up. And we forget the fact in our pride, that every good and perfect gift, James says, comes from God himself. We can forget through comparison. I was grateful of what I had until I compared it with somebody else who seems to have more. I can, I can forget through dissatisfaction. I can, I can forget because I'm looking to satisfy desires in the wrong places. And, and, and so that can leave me feeling empty and dissatisfied. And, 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 and it's leading, and so praise is not overflowing, it's a drain. We have to find ways of being people who don't forget, people who remind our souls. You know, maybe it's around the meal table with the lows you live with as you, as you eat dinner. What are you grateful for? What are you celebrating? What work or, or goodness of God in your life are you celebrating today? Maybe you're a journaler and you want to say, every single day I'm going to write three things that God has done in my life. Three things that I am grateful for. We have to find moments so that we aren't people who forget, but we are people who turn the taps on of praise in our lives, remembering the goodness of God and the things that He has done for us. The second thing, the second sort of tap that I see in this psalm is remembering God's story. When you go to verse 8, it says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. This is hesed, this is the loving kindness, the steadfast, faithful love of God. And when you're in a relationship, a friendship, a marriage, a household, you can have these sort of private jokes, like phrases that are almost like code words. They mean something completely different to maybe what they mean to other people. Um, you know what you mean when you say those things. This is like a code word for Israel, between Israel and Yahweh. In their relationship, when you see these words and you see them all throughout the Psalms, it's reminding you of something. David is reminding himself of something has happened in Israel's history. This, um, this, uh, these are the words that in Exodus 34, when, when Moses says, God, show me your glory. And Yahweh passes by in front of him. He proclaims his name. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Do you see? But um, Derek Kidner, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, says, calls it this. This is God's self-portrait. But as God paints the picture of himself, he doesn't just do it through a description of himself. He does it through a demonstration of himself. It's important to remember, where did Exodus 34 come? It came after the earlier story of Exodus where God redeems Israel. He, they, he takes them out of Egypt. He, he redeems them, brings them into relationship with himself. He gives them the tabernacle or the temple where God's presence dwelled among the people, the gift of himself. And then he gives them the law, the, the, the commandments that articulated how should you live if you're to live in relationship with me. But 
But as God sort of carves those words on stone tablets, the dust hasn't even settled. It's like the ink hasn't even dried on the marriage license before Israel have taken gold, formed it into a golden calf and are bowing down to it saying, this is the God that brought us out of slavery. This is the God that delivered us from the great, the, the, the superpower of the age, Egypt themselves. This was, this was I. Uh, idolatry this was adultery this is like adultery on the marriage day when the ink of the the marriage license hasn't even dried yet like this is so bad and God chooses that moment when they deserve it the least to reveal to them the character that they needed the most Israel did not deserve relationship with God to continue. They had broken the covenant. They had broken the marriage vows. And God says, you don't deserve it. But this relationship will continue because I'm gracious and I'm compassionate. I'm slow to anger and I'm abounding in love. And if that was the... And so what what happens throughout the Psalms, whenever these words uh, appear, it it is David or a psalmist reminding themselves or reminding the people, remember what God did for us remember that even though we failed he remained his character is is paramount in our story it characterizes our relationship with God from beginning to end and if that was a way of David filling his soul with praise how much more for us when we don't just see the character of God uh, God's self-portrait painted across the story of Israel we see it painted at Calvary where the son of God dies in our place and when God's character, God paints that picture with the colors of compassion and grace and, and being slow to anger and abounding in love. And we also see the color of justice in there where God punishes our sin and yet gives us, lavishes us with grace where we walk free from the death that we deserve to live in brand new life. We have to join with David when we fill our soul with this way. You know, where he says, when he reflects on this story and where we reflect on this story, where we say, as high as the heavens are above the earth, the greatest distance up and down that I can imagine, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, that the biggest distance I can imagine left to right is how far he has removed our transgressions from us. That's why we share communion every week. That's why we sing so many songs about the cross and about what Jesus has done for us. Because every time we come together we want to turn on the taps that fill our soul with the praise of the story of God the history of God in our lives and I think a drain comes where we forget this and we begin to maybe look at our track record I'm not who I used to be I'm, I'm, I'm serving in church. I'm in services. I'm, do, I'm, I'm a much better person than I was. It is a drain on praise because we start to believe that our relationship with God is based on what we have done. For eternity future, it will never be based on us. It will always be based on who He is and what He has done for us. That's why the worship of heaven revolves around the Lamb who was slain. And we say, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. That is how we plug the drain, the plug the plug hole, and we fill our soul with a reason to praise that is Him from beginning to end. Finally, I think we turn the taps on when we remember not only what He has done, but His faithfulness. Um, just before this moment it says as a father has compassion on his children and we can think that David is talking about what he's already been talking about but we realize in the contrast you'll notice this in scripture the pictures that are in contrast to to display a point And, and what David is saying here is that as a father has compassion on his children so the Lord has compassion on us and and what does he have compassion on the fact that we are mortal look the life of mortals is like grass they flourish like a flower of the field the wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more David is saying we as people flourish we thrive we succeed and yet our lives are lives are just a vapor just a breath they're here and gone but the contrast comes in this way but from everlasting to everlasting the Lord's love is with those who fear him our lives are just a breath our lives are fleeting our greatest success is just a a moment and yet he is everlasting he is everlasting and it makes me realize that I think one of the reasons one of the drains on praise for us can be that 
the temporary nature of life, the things we celebrate and the things we treasure can be gone in a moment. It's hard to enjoy something when it can just go in a flash. I think of the decades of peace in Europe that were interrupted by the invasion of the Ukraine. I think of I think of people who relied on, on the enduring nature of houses in Christchurch that a moment's earthquake led to liquefaction and those houses being worthless. I think of our season we've just been through of COVID where we had travel plans, we had plans to be with one another, we had a way of life, maybe being in the office or going to clubs and groups or even church services that in a moment as borders shut down and lockdown came, all of those things went away. And it can, it can make us believe that Everything is temporary. Nothing lasts. We shouldn't be able to enjoy anything properly because it might be gone in a moment. And into that context, as David comes face to face with his own mortality, he says, Ah, oh, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord endures. And therefore, my reason to praise can endure too. He becomes the sure foundation of our time and a permanent direction of our praise the taps are on and the plug hole is filled and so David closes the psalm in this way he calls the whole of creation to praise praise the Lord you his angels you mighty ones who do his bidding who obey as well like everything in heaven needs to praise God and then he goes verse 22 praise the Lord all his works like everything God has made needs to praise and everywhere in his dominion everywhere needs to praise David is saying all of heaven all the things all the places but notice praise the Lord my soul and all of me my friend is in an orchestra and he's the only trumpet in the orchestra and he has a solo in one piece but he has to count for 80 bars until his solo comes and one day he just got lost and it comes to his moment to shine and he's not, he's not, he's not where he should be and the conductor stopped everyone, you need to practice your solo, you know, a ruthless uh, moment. But as David calls the whole orchestra of creation to come together in worship of God, David reminds us that it's not just all things that need to praise, it's also all of me. I have a solo to play. I have a piece. I have a story of God's goodness and greatness in my life. Only I can play that part and I need to and I need to play it with all my heart. Are you playing your part today? Are you praising God with all of your heart? And if not, let's pay attention to the sort of bath of our heart, of the taps on. Are you taking time to worship? Are you, are you making gathering with other believers, whether in a small group or, or in a prayer group or a Sunday service? Are you taking time to fill the bath of your heart with reasons to praise or maybe you are, but actually there's things going on for you right now that are draining it from you. Maybe you've forgotten. Maybe you're stuck in a habit, a pattern of sin. Maybe you've forgotten his story and you've pretended it's about you. Maybe the idea of just things being enduring that struck you today, like you realize, whoa, I'm living like my life with God as if it's a COVID lockdown and the things I love could be taken in a moment and I need to come again to the enduring faithfulness of God. I wonder what it is for you. I'd just love us in this moment just to take a moment and say, where does the bath need to be filled today? What's the plug hole that needs to be filled? Oh Lord God, we thank you that you are compassionate. We thank you that you know that we are fleeting and changing and we struggle with faithfulness. As we come to you today, we pray, Lord, remind our minds, remind our hearts of the many blessings in our history, the many blessings in our lives. Forgive us for comparison. Forgive us for negligence. Forgive us for arrogance. Forgive us for forgetting. Lord, let, our, let the baths of our hearts be filled today that we might overflow, not just in a moment, but every single moment of every single day that we might live lives and speak words that overflow with praise. Let this be characteristic of our lives 
that in a world that is hungry for you, that we might show people a different way. We ask your help and your grace in this, in your name. Amen. Mm. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all my inmost being, worship and praise His holy name. How, how beautiful it is to remind ourselves that we each have uh, a part to play when it comes to, to worshiping God in the orchestra of creation. I, I love that picture. Um, what's your part to play in, in praising Him? And so as we, as we head into this time of communion, um, as we do every single week, we use these symbols to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us. Um, through this bread, we, we remember the body of, of Jesus that was broken, torn apart for us. We remember um, the blood of Jesus that was poured, poured out so that we might know the forgiveness of sins, that we might have our sins cleansed, completely cleansed and, and washed clean. There are so many reasons to praise and to worship God. And as we head into this time of communion now, I encourage you to remind yourself of, of all, of these, all of these reasons. A couple of reasons that we looked at today in the passage um, to, to help fill our hearts and remind ourselves of praise is God's perfect character. He is Yahweh, the Lord, the Holy One. Um, his, his perfect sacrifice. Oh, Jesus is incredible. All that he did for us. You might want to re rem remind yourself that God is eternal. And even though my life is, is fleeting, God lasts forever. There are so many reasons to praise and worship our Lord. And I encourage you to just remind yourself of those things now to, to do away with the things that drain the bath as it were uh, arrogance comparison dissatisfaction just doing away with those things and reminding ourselves of all that he is all that he has done for us all that he is doing in our lives and then we're going to head into a time of worship let me pray oh father we thank you so much for who you are, your perfect character. We thank you so much for what you've done, your perfect sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for all that is to come in our lives. We thank you that you are eternal, that we have a beautiful, beautiful hope. And as we, as we worship now, Lord, I thank you that we, we get to join in this call at the end of that psalm um, for all of heaven and all of earth, all created things everywhere to worship you. And so, Lord, as we remind ourselves of all that you are, all that you have done, all that is to come, we worship you, we praise you. Amen. I come before, before you now, and I lay my burdens down, Prince of Peace, Counselor, Son of the Father, I adore, I love you, Lord.
face in every sunrise the colors of the morning are inside your eyes the world awakens in the light of the day i look up to the sky and see your beauty Yes, Lord, you are. Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we honour you. You are beautiful, Lord. In all that you, all that you are and all that you've done, we say you are, you are beautiful, you are wonderful, you are perfect, and we worship you. We bless you. Amen. Hey, as we come in to close the, 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 the end of our service, before we do that, I just want to um, talk to you. If you're here, you're tuning in, and you're just kind of checking out what church is like, you're, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you're just interested. Thanks so much for joining us and watching. Um, I want to I invite you to reach out. Like We'd love to get to know you. Um, if you're watching this and you're like, yeah, you know what? I, I do. I want to become a Christian. I want to find out more. Um, please email us at online at the street .org .nz. Um, We would love, love, love to hear from you, connect with you, help you take uh, a step um, in, in how, what's next for you. Um, I think that's us, guys. Thanks so much for, for being here. Um, for joining us today. It's so, so beautiful, so wonderful to be together. Uh, thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Kakite Anon.